thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this um, IP2. Uh, very excited to be uh, part of any IP2 as, as usual. Uh, my name is Hani uh, Sarag. Um, I'm originally from Egypt. I currently work in the University of Texas Medical Branch. Before that, I served as a global coordinator of People's Health Movement from uh, the year 2006 to 2009 and then I continued to be uh, part of the Global Secretariat till um, early 2015. I was also responsible for um, coordinating IPHU, which is uh, something very close to my heart. So thank you very much for um, getting me back to be part of this IPHU. Today, um, I will talk briefly uh, about migration uh, and health, and I will focus on determinants of migration and how people's um, health, lives, and livelihoods are uh, impacted by migration. First, I would like to say that migration is nothing new. Human mobility is a part of human nature since the very beginning. If you go through the records and the statistics for human mobility and the relate number of migrants to number of people in our, in our world, you will find that there is no significant change. So the idea that we have increase in migration, it's not very right, but we have significant increase in force of migration. And this is the most important for me. Currently, uh, the International Organization of Migration estimated number of migrants with 1 billion. And here, when we talk about migrants, we talk about all categories. This includes immigrants, um, economic immigrants, include uh, in, uh, uh, internally displaced, um, international um, immigrants, uh, refugees, asylum seekers, and so on. So the whole number is 1 billion. Around uh, three quarters of them are internally displaced in their own countries, and only one fourth is international uh, 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 immigrants. So what are the causes? What are the determinants of uh, uh, migration? People migrate for different reasons. One of the most important reasons is reasons is war, conflict, political instability. This is one big category, followed by armed violence within the country, followed by poverty, income inequality, and recently climate change, which is uh, um, a very important my uh, um, determinant that's going to contribute more to uh, the number of uh, uh, migrants uh, all over the world. So starting with war, uh, conflict and political instability, and I would, I would like to look at it from a um, political economy uh, uh, lens. So wars are not bad for everybody. There are people who are make, making lots of profits out of wars. And unfortunately, these people and these corporates, they have a lot of influence of decision-making of big powers, including the US and EU. If you look at the recent wars, and I will just give two examples. One of them is Iraq. The, the whole mess in the, in the Gulf. The whole Iraq war was initiated based on a lie that Iraq has mass destruction weapons. And till now, we didn't find them. This war not only killed people and increased the asylum seeking and immigration from Iraq and destruct the infrastructure and everything, but also it affected to great extent the social fabric of the uh, society of uh, Iraq. And if you want to look at it 
again, from political economy lens, look carefully who is benefiting from the money of selling the oil of Iraq right now. What companies? What is the percentage that Iraq is taking out of the oil? Some literature took about just something around 20% and around 80% go outside to uh, uh, big companies basically in the US and uh, Europe. In Egypt, which my home country, we have 60,000 political prisoners. And everybody knows. Still, there is a massive support from European Union and from US administration to the dictatorship in Egypt. Why? Because there is a lot of trade interest and also exportation of weapons. The oil trade is not going to continue as is if there is democracy. The wars, controlled wars in the Middle East will not continue as is. The Israeli forces will not continue to kill Palestinians every day if there is democracy in the Middle East. So democracy in the, in the Middle East, human rights protection, things like that, it's just a talk, but there is no clear steps from the West to end it. One of the good examples for that is Central America. And one of the biggest countries with armed violence, domestic armed violence, is El Salvador. Even with the previous progressive uh, government succeeded to decrease the income inequality to great extent in El Salvador, the violence did not stop because if we allow violence to start, it has its own dynamics. So it will be out of control because it became a part of the governance of the country. Unfortunately, these criminals or these uh, um, gangs became part of the government. So we cannot stop them very easily. Another example for foreign policies responsible for migration is NAFTA, the bilateral trade agreement um, in North America. And NAFTA contributes significantly to impoverishment of uh, small um, Mexican farmers and those lost their livelihood because the U.S. subsidized its corn uh, greatly uh, so the, the farmers cannot export their uh, uh, crops because of the agreement. So it, it, it ended up they are uh, uh, in poverty and when they migrate, they are not accepted. So we, 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 we make policies to impoverish people and we do not accept them to move. They have to die where uh, uh, um, uh, they are. The, the World Bank, I, I, I don't usually uh, quote uh, uh, the World Bank, but I, I, I would say it announced that in 2050, there will be massive increase in climate change migrants. They call it climate migrants. And there was a figure of 143 uh, million uh, uh, people who will be forced to leave their places, livelihoods, because of the climate change. And again, instead of lots of agreements about uh, uh, mitigation of uh, uh, the change and so on, there is no real serious steps to slow down the uh, climate change as anybody would expect. People who are migrating from a place to uh, uh, another, in most of cases, they are kind of isolated in their communities. I'm, I'm here working with communities of uh, refugees in, in the US. They are isolated. They are... Um, uh, um, th their health indicators are getting uh, um, uh, worse, you, you know, they started 
sometimes better than uh, the average of Americans, but they are getting uh, uh, worse. Um, access to healthcare is very uh, complicated, even when refugees are allowed to have Medicaid kind of insurance uh, support by, by state in the US, but uh, it's a lot of paperwork and people cannot have access uh, immediately. It's not straight uh, forward. And this is no mention to those we call undocumented or they do not have papers, who do not have any uh, access. Uh, migrants are put in the detention uh, uh, centers in uh, the US and some of European uh, countries. And all of us know exactly what detention centers mean. They are prisons. And actually sometimes they are worse than prisons because the countries are not paying lots of attention to these people. They consider them just criminals came from outside and we do not have any responsibility for them. But if, if, if Europe is receiving migrants from Africa, they need to think a little bit of what leads to this migration. What did we do to Africa and uh, uh, led to, to, to this massive uh, uh, migration? I think um, that lots of policies made uh, uh, by the, the, the US foreign policies and European foreign policies, including the uh, structure uh, uh, adjustment programs contributed to great extent uh, um, for um, uh, impoverishment uh, in, in Africa and uh, other places. Talking about uh, um, healthcare uh, uh, personnel, which is very, very important, the, mi uh, the migration of healthcare uh, personnel. And I would like to use what our comrade David Sanders um, reminded us before during the time of Ebola, number of physicians who are graduated from uh, universities in Sierra Leone and work in Sierra Leone, they were less than those who are graduated from Sierra Leone and work in the US, in, in, in the UK. So the, 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 there is, a, there is a, a shortage, huge shortage of healthcare personnel in um, in the global uh, south, in many countries in the global south, part of that is responsibility of the global uh, policies. Not 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 only the international recruitment. It's it's just one of the reasons. But it's not it's not the huge uh, region of uh, migration. But the lack of incentives and the the harsh working conditions of health uh, care workers in Global South is the main contributor to um, uh, 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 migration. And this is, I would say, and I, I, I have my own experience in that, the fragmentation and deterioration of health care systems in these countries is one of the main reasons uh, for migration of health care. One of the um, issues right now and especially when we talk about um, uh, those who do not have um, uh, papers, documents, the, the, the migrants, uh, talking about the vaccine, how these people are going to access vaccine. Actually, in, in, in a place like the US, they need to be invisible. They need not to appear anywhere because the fear of deportation so these people will not sign up themselves in any database or any place that would make them visible for deportation. So it's, they will not be vaccinated most, most, most likely unless we have different progressive policies for vaccinating everybody. And in some states, in the US, they have this tendency, especially in a place like California. So it's it's different uh, policy. I'm not very uh, familiar with the policies in this regard in Europe, but I think it will not be completely different. Undocumented migrants, they do not have any uh, sub, any any legal uh, support to have coverage. In addition to that, even if they have kind of 
uh, access like in the US system, for example, people can go to the emergency uh, rooms, you know, even if they don't have any, any kind of access to any health care. But undocumented migrants will not go unless they have something really serious because they can be caught and deported. So there are two issues here. One of them is to provide access and legal coverage for this access in a very good way. And number two, to make healthcare facilities are safe places. These are not places to catch people and deport them. So we need to separate these two issues completely. I hope that we do not deport anybody, but at least starting with healthcare facilities are not a place to pick up uh, undocumented people. And also talking about uh, X vaccine, I want to talk about the internal, internal displaced. Look at the sign right now, what's, what's going on there. The uh, um, Israeli occupied forces succeeded to provide to um, Israeli nationals uh, vaccines to great extent. Right now, I think they exceeded 120 uh, uh, shots per uh, uh, 100 people. So it is the first uh, uh, place with this uh, um, uh, kind of, of trend but they do not vaccine Palestinians at all. They denied the vaccination of Palestinians. And when they opened it, they opened it for examples like physicians who are working in hostels in Jerusalem, you know, like those who are working in Jerusalem or parts of uh, the, the state of uh, um, Israel. So it's kind of to protect the Israeli people or Israeli nationals rather than to protect Palestinians. So there is denial, denial, complete denial to the right of these people uh, to uh, uh, vaccine. So this is a kind of uh, racism and it's against all the human rights treaties. So clearly, but again, the international community is celebrating the success of the uh, occupation forces of Israel in uh, the vaccination campaign and extremely silent about what's happening in Palestine and trying to find a way to uh, uh, give some vaccines from uh, COVAX to uh, uh, Palestinians. No pressure on Israel at all, at all, from, from, you know, from anybody, you know. And this is quite, uh, quite a big, a, a big lesson, uh, waiting for the international uh, community in terms of governments or more fair uh, treaties and so on is, is not a solution from my point of view. The solution is on, on ground activism. And I still, very much inspired regardless where it land right now i'm still very much inspired by the arab spring and i don't see any way for significant change unless people occupy the street so the real movement on the ground trying to change policies by negotiation here we are not talking about convincing people. We are talking about extreme difference in interests. So if you talk about anti-war, this means change. Stop wars means you are challenging very big interests of those who have the means to influence the decision making. So this is the, the, the issue, and they have the media, they have all the means. So the, the, the activism on the ground, street activism, remains the solution from my point of view. It's not the only solution. We have to take all opportunities, 
but um, we still need the move on the ground.